Library. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. Tonight we have the honor and pleasure of having author Anita, I'm sorry, Nita Sweeney, as she discusses her book, Depression Hates a Moving Target. And I am so excited to listen to this. Talking, book talking, or trying to get people to come to this program was really easy because they love the title. We put it up on our Facebook and we had a, a great response because so many people said, I really need to hear this because they, everyone is trying to figure out how to move through a situation and this really struck a nerve. So I thank you for coming. I thank you for taking your time out. I thank your family for being here and the rest of us. Thank you for coming and listening to this. Thank you again, Nita. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, it, feel, it really feels like a privilege to be here. I, I uh, you know, sort of just contacted them and um, we were going to be here. It all just worked out really well. So uh, it's very synchronistic. Uh, uh, so yeah, I am Nita Sweeney. I currently live in Columbus, Ohio. And uh, my uh, book, Depression Hates a Moving Target, will be coming out May 15th. Um, I think the write-up said uh, we would have books. I don't have books yet, because it doesn't come out to May 15th. But it is available for pre-order, and we can talk about all those details later on. So what I was going to do was read a little bit from the book, and then talk a little bit about my experience, and then kind of take questions, too. I um, have been living with uh, chronic depression probably since I was a teenager, but it wasn't diagnosed until I was in my early 30s, and uh, it's been a roller coaster ride. And so when I started running and things started changing pretty dramatically, it just felt like a story I wanted to tell. I've been writing a long time. I've actually written 10 books, but they're, most of them are in first draft stages that may never see the light of day. Um, so this is the first book that's published. So it feels very um, kind of dream come true-ish, sort of pinch me-ish kind of thing. And um, uh, so I just wanted to share that. So I'm just going to read a little bit and then talk a little bit and we'll see how it goes. All right? You guys ready? You guys ready? Yeah. <laughs> okay. so. so this is the prologue. My mind was trying to kill me again. Who do you think you are, it growled, as I squatted in a green porta potty four and a half miles into the Columbus Marathon. The sun shining on the white top bathed me in a gray light. The running partners I'd begun the race with that morning and trained with for the past four months had gone ahead without me. They would have stayed. I'd spent a mile convincing them to leave after I could no longer ignore my bowels. Alone in the fiberglass cubicle, trying to avoid sitting down, I shivered with loneliness as I finished my task. Mom, Dad, Jamie, all dead. My other ever faithful husband, my sister and friends, all still very much alive, were on the course, but miles away. Even the dog, my other regular running companion, was absent at home, probably asleep. This left me in treacherous company with only my mind forever critical. Someone in the line outside knocked. I would have to carry my heavy heart across the pavement solo. I'm a runner, I whispered to my mind. Then I pulled up my panties, opened the door, and ran. So that's where it starts. And then we jump back to kind of where it began. Um, this is from chapter one, off the sofa and into the ravine. Five months before my 49th birthday, I slouched on the sofa in my pajamas, squinting at my laptop screen. A high school friend's social media post read, call me crazy, but the running is getting to be fun. I remembered Kim riding horses in high school, but neither of us had been athletes then, and we certainly weren't now. I read on. She had begun an interval training plan to run three times a week. The website suggested alternating 60 seconds of jogging with 96 seconds of walking. 60 seconds sounded almost possible, but depression clung to me like a shroud. It was noon on a weekday. As usual, I'd just gotten up and hadn't showered in days. The simple act of walking Morgan, our yellow Labrador, around the block often proved too difficult. A 
few minutes into browsing Kim's interval running schedule, an extra long burst of hiccups reduced me to sobs. I cried until they passed, closed the laptop, and went back to bed. Still, her running post nestled like seeds in the back of my consciousness. Later that week, Kim posted, week one finished. Infected by her glee, I remembered the pleasure that I'd had when I'd run short distances decades before. The seed sprouted. Around the same time, Fiona, a writer friend from London, also took up running. She loved buying trainers, sneakers. Her emails reminded me of my first trip to a running store decades earlier when I'd scoffed at the price tags to hide being intimidated by the options. Fiona also talked about how running felt and the glow after. She's younger than me, but she's not a youngster. That seed grew. And then I started dreaming about running, skip that part, which was very weird. It's like, I thought I was dreaming about flying, but after a couple of these recurrent dreams, I realized, this is running. So, um, one March weekday, inspired by the daffodils bursting through the soil of the winter flower beds, I returned to the running website. This might kill you, came the familiar voice in my head. I recalled Kim and Fiona's smiles. 60 seconds of jogging hadn't killed them. A wise part of my mind thought exercise might energize me while a deep animal instinct tried to protect me by scoffing. You're old and fat. People will make fun of you and you'll die of heart failure. Most people have these competing voices. Mine are just louder. Drawing strength from the flying and floating sensations of my dreams, I wrestled tube socks over my flabby calves, sweatpants across my wide hips, a long sleeve t-shirt and hoodie over my thick belly, and a pair of trail shoes, the closest thing to running shoes I owned, on my swollen feet. Ed, my husband, was at work, so didn't see my unwieldy outfit. Morgan circled and nearly knocked me down when I opened the closet where we keep his leash. I would need his support. I picked up a digital timer, a digital kitchen timer, and went outside. Most of the residents of our maple and sycamore-filled residential neighborhood were at school or work. Even if they were home, they probably weren't looking out the windows of their 1950s ranch houses. Still, I imagined the neighbors not only watching, but laughing if they saw me try to run. I steered the dog toward Donna Ravine, a secluded street down a hill along a creek where the houses sit far back on wooded lots. Once I felt safely hidden, I set the timer for 60 seconds and bounced tentatively in my trail shoes. The small white timer in my sweaty hand was a welcome friend. It had carried me through years of mindfulness meditation periods and decades of the 10 minute writing practices that I'd learned from author Natalie Goldberg. Perhaps it would serve me well again. Morgan sniffed, peed on the newly sprouted leaves of a shrub, then stared into the distance. This is gonna hurt, I told him. My mind had replaced the floating feeling of my dreams with a movie montage. First, a day nearly two decades before, when I pushed myself around an indoor track, gasping dusty air. Then another day when, bone tired from long hours practicing law, I'd cut a run short because I couldn't make it up one more hill. And finally, one day, when my mind decided I was through, the dog stared up at me. He had no fear. What do you think, Hank, I asked, referring to the pink tinge of his almost brown nose. He cocked his head and perked his copper-colored ears. I hit the timer and began to jog. It hurt. Pain spread through my chest as my boobs bounced ferociously in my ancient sports bra. Due in part to medications, a healthy portion of the weight I'd gained in the past 16 years was in my breasts. I slowed and bent my knees. This reduced the bouncing and hurt less. I wondered if it was also easier on my joints. I would later learn this was true. In 60 seconds, the timer went off. When I yelled, we did it, Morgan looked confused. I'd been jogging so slowly he hadn't needed to break stride. I didn't care, I tasted victory. Pleasant memories from decades past surfaced. Running in the rain, happy and soaked, feeling tough as I plowed through puddles, outrunning younger men, feeling strong, young, and pretty. But as we walked, jogged our way out of the ravine to where the homes sit closer to the road, 
These images of running glory faded. The window stared at me. I turned around and jogged back down the hill out of view. So eventually I did get out of the ravine. And uh, um, but this was kind of, you know, it was such a, it, it was such a victory. And I talk about in the book um, what had happened in the years, just the, the few years before all of this. And uh, the people I mentioned at, in the prologue, mom, Jane, dad, um, those were um, only three of the people who had died. Uh, well, actually, dad didn't die during 2007, but during the year 2007, I kind of lost count. It was either, um, it was like two or three family members and three other people and a cat all died in 2007. Um, and my depression had just gotten really, really bad. And people kept telling me things like, if I just break a sweat, I feel better. Or if I just you know, take a walk, I feel better. And I would say, oh, but my knees, or oh, but my back, or I'm just so tired. And, um, but when I saw these two friends, and the one woman lived in London, and she would write, I was in an online writing career, and she would write about it, and, and, uh, and this other friend would post, and it, there was something in me that knew that if I could just do something, it would help. And so that, that has really been my experience. And so I'm just going to read a little bit from um, something later in the book, which I kind of didn't print. And so let's hope this works. 